Let's click the button. Okay, hi everyone. Welcome to the Scopus Institute Colloquium. Today we are very pleased and honored to have John Cartmel. John's early work on generalized algebraic theories is used heavily in our work on algebraic Julia and categorical logic here in Topos. Uh, but today he'll be speaking on a different but related topic, uh, exploring the mathematical theory of data. So without further ado, John, whenever you're ready. Thank you, Xiaowei. Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you, Xiaowei, for inviting me to present and for organizing it. Thank you, everybody, for coming to listen. As you see, I'll be talking about the mathematical theory of data. And though this is only partially formed, it's something that's quite close to my heart. Um, so I really appreciate the, uh, you know, the chance to speak about it. I'd just like to um, just like to mention three papers before I start for real, so I guess this is a commercial. I'd like to mention three papers that I've posted on my ResearchGate page. The first uh, contains some useful background to the talk that I give here. The second um, describes some algebras that I first defined about 50 years ago, and I defined them to be the algebraic equivalents of the syntactic notion of a generalized algebraic theory. At the time, I was being supervised by Professor Dana Scott. And I took Dana a draft of my thesis in which I defined generalized algebraic theories. These algebras, these that I now call concept instance algebras, and a lengthy proof of the equivalence of the two. Dana didn't seem too impressed. <laughs> um, and he simply said, couldn't you make these algebras into categories like Lavia has done? So I went away crestfallen. And by the next morning, I had the definition of contextual categories. And I also had the onerous task of proving that contextual categories and GATS, generalized algebraic theories, were equivalent which of course I did, and I went on to write up the proof of my thesis. So, good to talk to you, Dana. Thank you for taking me into your research group at Oxford, and thank you for posing that couldn't you just question. The third paper here is also related to my thesis. It explores the definition of models of generalized algebraic theories in sets and families of sets but without going via the definition, via uh, the contextual categories. Um, but generally speaking, I speak of instances rather than models. And this is because I want to use the word model as all the scientists use it and not as it's used in mathematical logic. Therefore, me, theories have instances, not models. So carrying on with terminology, just to set the scene for the talk, I speak, modeling for me is theorizing. I speak of instances of theories rather than models of theories. I speak of data specifications, except sometimes I forget and I call them data models. And the act of constructing data specifications for me is called data modeling. A model of data, confusingly, is something else. Um, it's a theory describing what constitutes data specification. And most significantly, I'll be talking about them here, there are relational and nested relational models of data. The mathematical theory of data is a putative meta theory of data that supports technology independent reasoning about data specifications in all their forms. Um, why? Why a mathematical theory of data? Well, there are gross inefficiencies, I say, in software systems development and maintenance, namely that part of the activity that is the creation and maintenance of specifications of the data stored in databases 
and represented in messages variously communicated about systems and between components of systems. And these inefficiencies, I say, have been established and endorsed by a theory which is grossly inadequate. So a new theory is required to expose and remedy the shortcomings. But in all of this, the challenge is to positively impact best practice. So the mathematical theory of data is a meta theory. It covers principles and criteria for goodness of data specifications. It reveals the significance of commutative diagrams and therefore category. And it has a slogan on the tin and the slogan is good data modeling is good theorizing. Bit of history, prior theory. In 1970, Cod introduced the relational model of data, the idea of a normal form, the idea of a specification being in normal form. And a year later, he defined the term functional dependency and used it to define third normal form. In 1977, Fagin defined the concept of multivalue dependency and uses it to define fourth normal form. And two years on, he defined projection join normal form, which is also known as fifth normal form. Cod's relational model of data, of course, was hugely successful. And it's been said that Oracle Corporation grew to having a 42% share of an estimated 30 billion market for relational database technology. Meanwhile, in 1990, Cod says that the relational model is solidly based on two parts of mathematics, first order predicate logic and the theory of relations. My opinion is that this has been to found data modeling on the wrong mathematics. Cod's mathematical basis and therefore his model do nothing to guide the programmer as navigator nor do they encourage thinking about navigational path equivalents, i.e. diagrams that commute. Even though thinking about diagrams that commute is essential to the goodness of data specifications. So the right mathematical starting point for the theory of data, I say, is category theory. Goodness, Carter, from a mathematical perspective, Cod's normal forms and the other normal forms are not really normal forms at all. What they are is goodness criteria that articulate good engineering principles. So what I wish to show that we can genericize those relational database normal form, cri normal form criteria into abstract logical terms define goodness criteria that are generic, i.e. can be applied to any data specifications, not just to relational schema, and prove that the classic relational database normal forms are consequences of these generic goodness criteria. I'd also like to be able to articulate principles that make more sense to the normal forms than the goodness criteria by articulating general principles from which the goodness criteria, the generic goodness criteria follow. So my goal is to have fundamental principles from which individual generic goodness criteria follow, from which in the relational case, classic, the classic normal forms of COD and others follow. So abstractly speaking, a data specification is a presentation of a theory. And of course, we know that a theory can have many different presentations. In the case of a data specification, different specifications can have different roles and serve different purposes. Some presentations are said to be physical. And in those, the choice of primitives in the presentation is a choice of the individual elements to be represented in the data. 
Other presentations are said to be logical, and these seek to describe the data by directly describing the internal relationships in the data. And the logical presentation, as well as the theory itself, express the overall information content of the data. So the presentation describes how the data is represented, but the overall theory or the logical presentation of it express the information content contained. So the fundamental principles at this abstract level are the principle one absence of redundancy in the presentation. And principle two, that the theory be the tightest possible fit to the facts. And these, <laughs> these two principles collectively ensure absence of redundancy in data and in data management logic. And I should add that principle two expresses a kind of logical completeness of the theory. In a data specification, two kinds of types are in play. The definienga types all of whose instances are particulars. So employee, department, student, account, product, order, shipment, delivery, flight, booking, and so on, and it's endless. And actually on one project, one company that I worked for, when I worked for a science company, we had types such as molecular structure, atom, covalent bond, element, isotope, reaction, metabolite, mass, trace, and so on. And the other kind of types at play are the definiens, types, all of whose instances are universals. So the types we know in programming, string, integer, float, boolean, and so on. Now, so as not to get involved in strings, integers, float, booleans, and so on, I'm going to just assume a fixed set V of universals and define data specifications and instances relative to V. I need to get into more detail what kind of theory, what kind of presentation. I'm going to say that a data specification is a sketch of a structured category, and it's got these elements of structure in it. But before I go through those, uh, I thought it probably necessary to go through just this, these items, go through the background category theory that is involved. First of all, in the category C, a source is defined to be a family of morphisms with common domain. Such a source is said to be a monosource, if and only if for all parallel morphisms with codomain, the domain of the source. So F and G, sorry, G and H. If GFI equals HFI, if it follows from the fact that GFI equals HFI for each I, for I equal one to N, then it, if it follows that G equals H, then we say that the source F1 to Fn is a monosource. In the presence of Cartesian products, that will be uh, the same as saying the tuple F1 to Fn given by the product structure is a monomorphism. Um, data could have gaps in it, which is where we come to partial functions. So there's a category of sets of partial functions. For a partial function F from A to B, define its restriction line and potent to be the function F bar from A to A defined by F bar of A is A. If F is defined at A, F bar of A is undefined otherwise. And as we'll see in a moment, this bar operator satisfies four algebraic identities that enable us to reason about partial maps in a category setting. Also, similarly, for such a partial map F from A to B, we can define its range item potent to be the function F hat from B to B defined by F out of B is B. If B is in the image of F, so if there's an A such that F of A equals B, and F hat of B is undefined otherwise, and this hat operator 
satisfies a set of identities, R1, R1 to R5. Now, these definitions I'm taking from in the case of restriction categories in the bar operator, Cockett and Lack, Robin Cockett and Stephen Lack, uh, they define a restriction category to be a category along with an operator that maps every morphism F to an idempotent F bar in its domain satisfying these conditions. 2012, Cockett and others define a range category to be a restriction category with an additional operator now, if f from a to b, then f hat from b to b, so it's defined on the codomain of f, satisfying these four identities. And these identities include the hat and the bar operators. And they also describe a further condition which holds within the category of sets and partial functions. Um, Interesting results on the basis of it, um, which is an additional RR5 condition wishing to assume. Um, 2000s, well, the usual Cartesian product of sets, when we look at its properties, so the set of ordered pairs, when we look at its properties in the category of sets and partial functions, it doesn't satisfy the usual categorical Cartesian product conditions. It's not the usual Cartesian product. That... In 2006, Cockett and Lack define an appropriate notion of product, and they call it the restriction product of a pair of objects. Finally, on restriction categories, there is an ordering on each of the home sets of such a category. It's defined by f less than or equal to g if and only if f equals g bar composed with f. And we can think of f less than or equal to g as meaning that if f is defined at some point, then g is defined at that point and the two are equal. And I'll just mention <laughs> just mention that in my experience, there are a lot of data specifications and a lot that I've worked with that have near commutative diagrams. And if you can call it that, in that there are instances of relationships, F, G and H, such that F composed with G less than or equal to H. Finally, if M from A, if M from A to B is a monomorphism in a range category, then I will define a map and minus one from in the reverse direction from B to A to be a partial inverse of M if and only if M composed with M to the minus one is the identity on A and M to the minus one composed with M is M hat, the range of M. So that gives me RR5 range categories, finite restriction products, um, designated monomorphisms closed under composition and such that each monomorphism has a partial inverse. And I wish to add to this a distinguished object V, such that for every morphism leaving V in the category C, the morphism factors through m to the minus one for some monomorphism m. So a range category with this additional structure and satisfying R on five. For this presentation, I shall call a gamma structured category. And note that from this definition, it follows that a sketch for a gamma structured category there's no need for edges with domain V because every edge, every morphism that leaves V can be composed from an M to the minus one for some monomorphism whose target is V. So in this presentation, by data specification, 
I shall mean a sketch for a gamma structured category such that the designated object V has no outgoing edges. Just said that it didn't need them. Neither edges from V to V nor edges from V to non V nodes within the sketch. If S is a sketch for a gamma structured category, then I'll denote by C of S the gamma structured category generated from S. And I'll refer to this as the theory category. So I spoke earlier about presentations and theories. Well, S is the presentation and uh, the COS is the theory. It's a gamma structured category. I will define an instance of a data specification S to be a range functor from the theory category to the category of sets and partial functions which preserves, sorry, to be a range function that preserves this re specified restriction products the structure and maps the object lower V, the designated object lower V to the set of universals uppercase V. And such in F will also preserve designated monomorphisms and their inverses. And actually in the rest of these slides, I'll probably muddle up a bit data specifications and sketches. And that's because a data specification is a sketch and sometimes I say data specification and sometimes I say sketch. So apologies there if it's confusing. Okay, next I want to give some examples to show how all this works in practice. And the very next example is of the dear old relational model of data. So here we have three relational tables, student, professor, and department. Students and departments are identified by name. So those tables have a single key column in relational speak. Professors on the other hand are identified by a combination of departments and ID. So their two columns form the key of the professor table. If you look at this data, rows of the student table reference the department table by virtue of a column that instances values from the identifying column, the key column of that table, of the department table. And written in the language of relational data theory, this is written as a, an inclusion dependency, a referential inclusion dependency in this case, which is written like that. Similarly, the professor table has a reference to the department table. So we have students have departments and professors have departments. So we could think students belong to departments, and professors belong to departments. These referential inclusion dependencies, by the way, are implemented by referential integrity constraints by relational databases to enforce the data um, to be of this shape. Rows of the student table reference professor table by virtue of two columns instancing values from the identifying columns of the professor tables. So professor's got two keys, so there's two columns in the student table that reference the professor table. So students have supervisors and uh, that re relationship is expressed in relational language by this inclusion dependency. Similarly, departments, there are heads of departments, departments reference the, sorry, yes, departments reference the professor table, like so. Okay, referential inclusion dependencies, we can now see can be represented as identities in a range category. And this, so now think of each column of a table as a function that maps rows of the table to values represented by the set upper V actually. Each inclusion dependency can be expressed as an identity on the ranges of these functions. So each A of F contained in B of Q can be represented as saying that the range of F is less than or equal to the range of Q F hat less than or equal to Q hat in the category of sets and partial functions. Similarly, A of F1 to Fn contained in B of Q1 to Qn, that inclusion dependency 
can be represented by saying the tuple f1 to fn hat and excuse the the bad format in here that that hat applies to the whole tuple the tuple f1 to fn hat less than or equal to the tuple q1 to qn hat in the category of sets and partial functions therefore the description of the example tables in a relational schema can be expressed as a sketch for a gamma structured category. So the directed graph as a column, as a column, sorry. The directed graph has a uh, an edge for every column of every table. The monosources, well, I've indicated the monosources by putting bars on the graph to show which combinations of edges are monosources. And the identities or the translations of the referential inclusion dependencies into the language or the structure of a range category, which is like that. And, and though they're not identities at the moment, they're inequalities, but the way that less than or equal to was defined on the home set, we can quickly spell those out in more detail, but not necessarily any make it any clearer in doing that. So this now is a relational data specification. And I mentioned that there are different forms of data specification, different roles that we use data specification. And I want to distinguish between logical and physical data specifications. In physical data specifications, we can distinguish between relational and non-relational. In a relational sketch, all edges are of the non-V to V type, as we've just seen. And each such represents a column of the table of the relation. In other physical sketches, in addition to the non-V to V type edges, there are edges of the non-V to non-V type, and these represent structural containment. And I'll give examples later. Non-relational physical data specifications are also very often said to be hierarchical. So we can characterize a relational data specification by defining it to be a, a sketch, of course, such that all edges are of the non-V to V type. And because in relational tables, we expect a relational table to have a, a key, every non-V node is the domain of at least one V-valued monosource, i.e. for every non-V node A, for some n greater than or equal to one, there exists a source M1 to Mn, which is a designated monosource, i.e. for which the tuple M1 to Mn is a designated monomorphism. Next, I want to show how a relational data specification can be transformed into a logical data specification. If you do, you do. <clears throat> yeah. So for any classic relational data specification, there is an equivalent data specification, one with the same theory category, so that's very important, which is logical. In outline, we construct a series of sketches by eliminating each inclusion dependency in turn. When all are eliminated, then we're done. And we eliminate an inclusion dependency A of F1 to Fn contained in B of M1 to Mn by removing the dependency, replacing it by an edge from A to B, removing those Fi that are edges and rewriting any occurrences of such Fi in any of the remaining inclusion dependencies. We rewrite them and replace them by F composition Mi. And for those Fi that are not edges, we add a path equivalence, i.e. a commuting diagram F composed with Mi equals Fi. And I want to demonstrate how that works. So back to our original sketch for a relational, well, those three relational tables. Step one, 
remove the first inclusion dependency. So that means we add an edge from student de to department. We re remove the column of the referencing column of student, and we re uh, rewrite other occurrences of that column, and that get uh, moves us on to this sketch, and we continue. We eliminate the next inclusion dependency. We add an edge from professor to department. We strike out the dependency, we strike out a column and we uh, rewrite in the other inclusion dependencies, which brings us to this. Now, when we come to eliminate the next dependency, we see that um, one of the um, expressions on the left-hand side is not an edge, but the composition of D with D name. And therefore we add a commutative diagram as well as adding an edge, um, removing an edge and striking out the dependency. We continue in the same way, it's the same thing happens. We eliminate the final de dependency um, and the result uh, is this sketch. There's actually an arrow missing on that, but I'll, I'll fix that in a moment. Um, subject to these commutative diagrams. So if I just read all I've done now on this slide, and this fixes the problem, is that I've rearranged that last sketch um, just to be a bit easier to read. So this is the result in logical data specification. It is this directed graph subject to the commutivity of these diagrams. Um, and subject um, also actually and not shown necessarily on this slide to an, um, the specification of some monosources. Um, now, having seen one, we can characterize a logical data specification. A data specification is logical if and only if there does not an exist, sorry, there does not exist an edge E of the sketch S for which there is a decomposition in the theory category, which is to say there aren't any edges E such that for some morphisms F1 and F2 distinct from E, E is F1 composed with F2. So, standing back now, um, logical data specifications, logical specifications are new, they're used in industry, people write logical descriptions of data. And the current best practice is to write a logical data specification, to transform it automatically to a relational data specification. And essentially this is following a description given by Chen in 1976, which I'd call Chen's transformation. Uh, and having got a relational data space specification, then to normalize it following the prescriptions of COD, so that there is to, to output a new relational data specification, which, um, or to construct a new relational data specification, which now follows the normal form criteria. So what I'm calling here Chen's transformation is something that from a logical data specification constructs a relational data specification. And Chen's method is to replace an edge F from A to B in the sketch by edges F1 to Fn, where M1 to Mn is a V-value monosource with domain B, and to add inclusion dependence and in inclusion dependency, A of F1 to Fn containing B of M1 to Mn. Now, the problem with this method is that it doesn't take account of commuting diagrams. And, therefore, and that, therefore, is why the resulting relational specification doesn't generally end up in normal form. And actually, it doesn't have an equivalent theory category either. 
which is probably why it doesn't end up in old form. So this is a weakness in current practice. So the mission is to improve this algorithm, to have logical specifications that have that include commutative diagrams, as I have specified them here, in fact. And to take account of those commutative diagrams when generating a relational data specification. So then from a logical data specification, we can construct a relational data specification with the same theory category. So revised best practice is to go directly from a logical data specification in a completely automated way to a relational data specification. And to do so in such a way that if appropriate goodness criteria met by the logical specification, then the relational specification meet, will meet the classic relational goodness criteria, the relational norm forms. So the impact of a new diagram aware transformation will be that no normal, no manual normalization will be required. But that in turn means that no source code will be required to describe the physical level, in this case, the relational data specification. The only source code will be for the logical data specification. Sorry. Um, What we need though is goodness criteria that apply to the logical data specification. We need to go looking for those, but before we go looking for them, I want to broaden the scope a bit by talking about non-relational data and giving an example of non-relational data. So here we have a non-relational table. It's a nested set of nested relations. You could say it's a table within the nested relational data model. Now we see that students and professors are nested within the departments. The data for students and professors is nested within the data for the department for which they belong. So now instead of having four inclusion dependencies describing the references in the data, there are just two. So now now we see a combination of two things. We see structural containment and relational referencing. So the relational reference is, is there. There's two instances of it. Previously in the relational model, we had four instances of it. But now in this data, we see a combination of structural containment and relational referencing. And actually what I say is that kind of this is all there is in terms of structuring mechanisms for data, that the sole mechanisms for representing internal relationships in data are just these two, structural containment and relational referencing. And actually it follows from this you accept this view that all data can be viewed abstractly in terms of the nested relational data model. Because of course the nested relational data model as you can imagine includes the relational data model as a special case. So that, looking at that table there, we can represent its data specification by this sketch here for interpreting this as a sketch for a gamma structure category. So now we've just got four columns, four edges, codomain V. And now we do have edges that go from non-V node to non-V node. So from student to department and from professor to department. And these edges represent structural containment. So in this physical data specification, edges 
from non V nodes to non V nodes represent structural containment. And of course, as before, I can re jig these inclusion dependencies as identities within the range category structure. So we can characterize a physical data specification. A data specification is physical if and only if every non V node is the domain of at most one edge of the non V to non V type. So it can only be structurally contained once over. So in a physical data specification, every node and every edge has physical significance in the database or message structure. Nodes other than V represent entity types, if you use the entity relationship notation, or tables in the relational models, or structs if you use IDL, or similar in other languages. And edges of the non V to non V type represent those relationships in the data that are physically represented by structural containment. And the remaining edges, i.e., those of the non V to V type, represent attributes or columns or scalar fields, whatever terminology you might be using. And if you look at this logical sketch, which is the logical sketch we created by transforming the original relational sketch. Uh, I subtly annotated it now. I subtly annotated it now by putting some triangular headed arrows on two of the edges, the one from student to department and professor to department. So in this logical sketch, I have annotated it with information as to, let's say, a preferred hierarchical structure, preferred nesting. So this logical sketch, though it's a logical sketch rather than a physical sketch, it has a sort of physical sketch implied in it. It has this sketch here implied in it. And remember that the graph was subject to the commutivity of these triangles. And if you look at these triangles, um, you can actually look at them in terms of types that vary or dependent type notation. So generalized algebraic theories, if you like, and say that, and the diagram on the left can be expressed by saying D belong to department, X is a student of that department D, then supervisor of X is a professor within that same department D. And the diagram on the right, quite similar actually, can say, can be expressed by saying that for D being a department, head of department is a professor of that same department. Um, so there is a sort of tie up here and a lot of the diagrams, the commuting diagrams that you find in data are, are, are actually of this form, a great majority in my experience. So this is all very abstract. Um, how would you use this in practice? Well, it's something that I have used in practice. Uh, in my professional life. Here's an example, which is not written in the category notation, but is essentially the same. And this notation that I use here, which is a variant of the development of a notation of um, Barker, of Richard Barker, um, it is more efficient in space uh, than, than sticking with a directed graph. So here we have some example data from a project um, that I worked on when I worked for a science company. And this was a project to build an application for managing interpreting data from mass spectrometers using liquid chromatography in fact. And the application was written in JavaScript and Python and used XML and IDL as data formats. And at various points in the architecture, different languages and different representations were used. 
And the surprising thing is that there are 33 relationships implemented by structural containment, 26 implemented by relational referencing. But the really surprising thing is that there were 16 non-trivial commutative diagrams and there were six pullback diagrams. And um, this specification, these diagrams, these pullbacks were all generated um, into code, the various languages. Uh, and the project was very successful and very satisfying. So, um, just to recap, a data specification is a sketch S for a gamma structure category. An instance of a data specification S is a structure preserving functor from the theory category to the category of sets and partial function. Now I want to define a requirement for a data specification to be a set of such instances, i.e. define it as a set RC of structure preserving functions, a set of functors D from the theory category S to the category of sets and partial functions. Now, the fundamental principles I spoke of earlier, principle one, no redundancy now, is that the sketch S ought to be a minimum sketch for a structure category C, i.e. there should be no subsketch of S which generates C. And principle C, which I shall define in detail in a moment, is that principle two is that C ought to be maximally constrained to RC. I'll define what this means, but it's the most fundamental way of saying that C is the tightest fit to the facts in the requirement RC, the set of instances. But there's another way of approaching tightest fit that, um, which is to say that that which is in the requirement and can be represented in the requirement. I'm sorry, let me, let me say that again. There's another way of approaching tightest fit. And the other way is to say that which is in the requirement and can be represented in the theory should be represented in the theory. And to make this, we can make this precise by giving definitions of representational completeness. So we can define goodness criteria 2A, 2B, 2C, and describe them as being equationally complete, functionally complete, referentially complete, and so on. Um, and in all of these definitions that C is X complete, where X is some element of structure, if C is X complete with respect to RC, we'll mean exactly that the set of instances RC are jointly reflective of X. So equational completeness, if C is a gamma structure category and RC is a set of instances, then say that C is equationally complete with respect to the requirement RC, if and only if all paths Sorry, let me repeat that. If C is a gamma structure category and RC is a set of instances, then C is equationally complete with respect to the requirement if and only if. Whenever we have a path equivalence, so whenever F and G are parallel morphisms in C, and whenever in every instance, the instance of F equals the instance of G, i.e. D of F equals D of G. If then it follows that F equals G, then C is equationally complete with respect to that requirement. In other words, the set of functions are C is jointly faithful, which is a bit easier to say. So goodness criteria 2A is that if S is a sketch for a gamma structure category C, considers a data specification with requirement RC, then C ought to be equationally complete with respect to RC. So that's the first goodness criteria. Next goodness criteria. For this, I need to lift Codd's definition of functional dependency and make that definition again in the context that we're in. And then I need to 
lift from Zaniola, 1982, the idea of a functional dependency being represented. And then the criteria will be that all functional dependencies ought to be represented in the spirit of Zaniola's paper. So if C is a gamma structured category, and RC is a set of instances, if F and G are morphisms in C with a common domain, then there is a functional dependency of G on F with respect to RC. If and only if, well, if and only if um, D of F factors through D, D of G, sorry, D of G factors through D and F, D of F in every instance D. So if and only if there's a partial function HD, whose domain is the range of D of, of F, such that D of F composed with HD is D of G. And if that is the case, we'll say that G is functionally dependent on F, which is written as F R of G in relational theory. We'll write F R of G with H on top to say that the family of partial functions H witnesses that functional dependence. No intention of implying a two category structure or some such here, by the way. So um, we say a functional, if there is a functional dependency with respect to a requirement, if there is a functional dependency of G on F, then we'll say that that functional dependency H is represented in C if and only if there exists a morphism H from B to C that for every instance D maps to the function H sub D. So um, we could say that C is functionally complete with respect to RC if and only if every functional dependency is present in RC, that, that is present in RC is represented in C. And goodness criteria 2B, uh, if S is a sketch for a gamma structured category C, considered as a data specification with requirement RC, then C ought to be functionally complete with respect to RC. I'll continue here. I stated earlier that I was looking for generic criteria which implied the specific relational criteria. And what I think we can show or what we want to show is that for a simple relational data specification S with requirement RC, if S meets the minimality condition, condition one, and the theory category meets the goodness condition 2B, then X meets the condition conditions of COD's third normal form. If in addition, each designated monosource of the associated logical sketch. So if for each monosource M1 to MN, each MI is an edge in the logical sketch, then the data specification S meets the conditions of Boyce COD normal form. If in addition to one, we follow principle one and interpret this as meaning do not introduce limits into a sketch needlessly, then the data specification S meets both of the normal form criteria defined by Fagin. So the significance will be that we've got criteria 2A, 2B and so on, which are generic in the sense that they apply to any kind of data specification on which genericize the classical relational normal form criteria. Earlier I mentioned a sort of more fundamental principle that C will be the tightest fit to the facts. 
or should be the tightest fit to the facts if sees it, the theory associated with the data specification. So the question is, is there a C prime that extends C that will do a better job? So is there a C prime and a structure preserving function from C to C prime? C prime, of course, a gamma structured category. Such that all instances in the requirement, so all D in RC uniquely factor through I. Now, if that is the case, then C prime is a candidate for being a better, a, data, a better data specification than C, a tighter fit to the facts. It's actually a tighter fit to the facts if there's some instance of F that doesn't factor through I. So if there is no such C prime and no such I, then we sh shall say that C is maximally constrained with respect to the requirement RC, meaning that the structure of category C is the tightest possible fit to the facts that are in the requirement that are represented by the requirement RC. So what we'd like to show is that a sketch meets that if a sketch meets principle one and if the theory meets principle two that it should be maximally constrained and it also meets the specific representational completeness criteria 2a 2b 2c and so on and if we can get to this then we have fundamental principles which are both generic across all kinds of data specifications and which imply the specific representation completeness criteria which in turn imply the classic relational normal forms so um, that really brings me to the end of my presentation. And just to remind you, we're looking for, we're looking um, to firm up on these goodness criteria to have a diagram aware transformation from logical data specification to relational data specification and the impact of that um, it's no manual normalization, no source required for the physical level. And uh, I think there's, um, there's um, that's a big improvement. Thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, so. Uh, I think I've gone over, I'm sorry about that. No, no, that, that's okay. Um, I, I'm really glad you did and finish, uh, finish with the goodness criteria and I, I personally really like the talk because I, I I worked quite a while in startups and uh, research organizations and and <laughs> this is the tool that we need. Right. So um, I have many questions, but I'm going to uh, give the chance uh, to others. Uh, so how we do questions here in the Topos Colloquium chat is that we uh, uh, to Topos Colloquium is that you could either ask your question in the chat and I could ask on your behalf, or you could uh, raise your hand and then. Uh, I will call on you to unmute yourself to ask the question yourself. So, um, are there any anyone's with uh, questions in in the Zoom chat? Uh, Dana, you have a Hi, question. Dana. Go. Hi, Dana. <laughs> yes, I have a I have a short question that could lead to a longer answer later. But <laughs> let me get it on the table. Yeah. Do you see a role? for formal theorem proving for these categories. For example, with categories with partial functions, Christoph Benchmuller and I pointed out that there are very nice realizations of the general definitions in a version of Isabel. And he uh, gave several examples of proving some theorems about categories of course, of a general nature uh, in that formulation. However, uh, there could be lots of specific theorems about a particular category that is being used for a special kind of data. So my question is, do you think computer-assisted theorem proving can be helpful?
if we can do it, it's got to be helpful, hasn't it? Um, I've actually worked on a zero improver at one time, but I don't consider myself an expert by any means. Um, yes, um, I don't have any specific insight into it, but the more that we can automate, the better. And um, the more that we can formally verify, the better, in my opinion. Thank you. Uh, sorry, John. Did you? Um, they know what's that? Was was that? Uh, was that what you're looking for? Well, uh, in general, yes. But uh, I think the best thing is to uh, for the people who are interested and uh, to uh, get down to some uh, specific examples to see what could happen. So. Uh, that that can be a project to actually uh, work out some kind of example of where a theorem improvement is needed. So yeah. uh, that's you, a that's a future activity. Yeah, it's it's a bit off topic, Dana. But what I would really like is for someone to automate the algebra that shows the concept. Instance algebras are equal, basically, to contextual categories. It's an awfully lengthy algebraic proof, and it hasn't been done. It would be nice to see somebody do that by automating it. Hmm. Thank you, John. Uh, I, I have a quick question uh, from someone uh, before we go on to the other questions. Uh, they had, uh, Seth asked if there's a preprint for your work. Um, is there... Uh, for for people interested in reading up more, is there a preprint we can we can read? Sadly, not. Um, I shall start uh, start to write up this material. Um, it's probably my next job, actually. So, and I'll post anything that I write on my research uh, research code page. Yeah. Yeah. Or uh, at the very least, we will post the slides uh, for your talk on the website. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, uh, people can refer to that. Okay, yeah, that preparation to... paper that I referenced at the beginning has kind of got the same shape of this, but it just says, what if a, what if a data specification is just a category? But a data specification is a lot more than a category. Mm. So it exercises the process that we need, that I, you know, I need to go through with this and write up. Um, and the reason I did it that way is because I was getting bogged down in detail and I wanted to do a, a simpler case. Um, so that's why I did this paper that said preparation for a mathematical theory data. Thank, thanks a lot. We're, we'll be looking forward to, to that. Thank you. Um, okay, so uh, I see that Nathaniel, you have a question. Would you like to unmute yourself? Hi, John. Thanks for the talk. Hi, really interesting. Yeah. I had a, a quick question about one of these uh, last slides when you were talking about the, the question of maximally constraining yeah. uh, some sketch to the yeah. requirements. Yeah. So in, in the more simple setting of uh, algebraic theories, there's this construction that takes some model, or I suppose an instance of an algebraic theory, and constructs a new theory which sort of captures that as closely as possible, which is a yeah, part of this, yeah. so, the Levia so structure semantics. Is this yeah. the sort of thing that you're looking for? Is that Levia's? Is that Levia's? Um, is that Levia's uh, construction? Yeah, yeah exactly. It's the, the structure yeah. functor that Levia studies yeah, yeah, thesis. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, so, so that sounds the sort of thing that yeah, you're looking you're, for you're here. In, you're in. You're in the right area, very much so. Um, and when I. I'm almost a bit embarrassed to give this definition of maximally constrained because I feel that someone should be able to say, oh, that's such and such a thing that you mean. And, and you've almost done that. And, and um, yeah, so I'm not sure if we can any closer to it than, you know. 
it seems a really obvious sort of uh, construction or question definition. So the, well, I, I don't have an answer to that, but uh, there's um, a paper which seems somewhat related, at least the categorical ideas seem yeah. similar, definitely not the same, but uh, maybe useful. So I'll, I'll post it in the, the chat yeah, or okay. send you an email afterwards. Yeah. Uh, because it also okay. uses restriction categories to capture sort of specifications. Oh, right. Um, okay. I, yeah, actually, does it, does everyone know about restriction categories and range categories? I, I, I had no idea whether they were common currency or not. It's the first time I've heard, heard of them, but um, I'm not sure if the others uh, have heard of it. But they're very, very interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think they're lovely, actually. <laughs> <laughs> um, I only came across them recently. <laughs> um, my, my impression is that they've been uh, growing in popularity lately, oh, right? but uh, they're oh, still right? not yeah. Yeah. very well known. Right. Okay. Yeah. I agree. Yeah, I think nice. I think it's really neat, actually. And, and what they do for me here is, you see, you can manage without. If you didn't have them, you can use subobjects to represent partial maps. You take a subobject of the domain and have a total map, essentially. But then I get. But if you do that, you get all these objects that I don't want in a data specification because I want the objects to be the tables or or struts or whatever. So the restriction categories stop you sort of multiplying up the number of objects uh, without bound almost. So I, I, when I saw them, I thought they were really neat. Thanks, thanks, Sean. I, I wow, well, I yeah. uh, and Nathaniel as well for that question. Um, Brendan has this comment that if uh, these uh, restriction categories and range categories have been discussed at ACT or applied category theory in the most recent years, but only in a few papers. So I, 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 I think this. Uh, is uh, just like what Nathaniel said about things becoming um, uh, more pop. This becoming more popular in recent years. Yeah, yeah. So uh, we have a question from Kevin who had to leave uh, for another meeting. Uh, so his question is about uh, the requirements. So yeah. uh, first he wanted to ask about uh, if you could talk about examples of requirements. Uh, what yeah. what some of them look like? Yeah. Uh, because um. Usually for, for us at Topos, we, we focus on the full category of instances. Yeah. And this, the second question, which is related, is to say something about why a relational presentation is so valuable. And again, uh, because uh, for us at Topos, we focus mainly on what uh, are very similar to your uh, logical specifications. Yeah. Instead of yeah. requirements. Yeah. 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 Well, um, sorry. This... There's two questions there, and I'm going to have to get. Let's, <laughs> what was the first question? The first question is not in very good shape. So what of, was the first uh, question? First question was an example of requirements. Yeah, so that's a good question. So if you take the set of all instances, then you're kind of assuming that whatever structured category you've got is the right structured category for the job. But actually, um, when you consider whether a data specification is appropriate for a job, you're usually thinking about all the possible usages, you know, all the possible states of the accounting system or state or whatever it is. You're thinking of all possible, you, you've talked to the users and you've got a sort of set of ideas about the range of things that you want to be able to store in the data. So when you write a data specification, you're trying to get that as you're trying to constrain what you can put in the data structure to match as closely as possible the range of things that can happen in the real world. Say. So, um, so the way of capturing that is that given a data specification. Yes, there's a set of all possible instances. But the interesting thing is, what's the difference between the set of all possible instances and the actual instances that you want for the job in hand? So the instances that you want for the job in hand is what I've called the requirement. I see. So it's constraining the instances further. Um, yeah. Well, and, and yeah, some kind of attack for that. Generally, yeah. So, um, 
So, um, mm. sorry, but, sorry, sorry. I'm, 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 I'm a bit slow. <laughs> <laughs> um, sorry. I've just had one thing more about that. So, if you relational theory in order to define functional dependencies and so things like that they have to assume a set of instances they start with a table and then assume a set of instant i can't remember what they call it but assume a set of instances of that table and then they ask whether you know what columns are functionally dependent and what other columns so they actually have the same thing of course it's not expressed categorically but it's there in the theory in the relational theory so we need the requirement, you know, for the theory to be able to um, define the goodness criteria. Okay. Um, Kevin's second question was about um, why a say some to say something about why a relational presentation is so valuable. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. So the relational. Well, I, I sort of put that slide up that said. 42% of a, what was it? I can't remember the numbers. You know, there's a huge lot of relational database and a huge lot of money goes into programming and running relational databases. Um, I really don't like relational databases. Well, if I have to build a system, if it's my job to choose the technology, I might well build buy, and I have done actually, a relational database. So I in my last job, actually, I chose Oracle as the database for the company's business. Um, you know, it's proven, everyone knows quotes, everyone knows how to program Oracle and so on. So, but do I like relational data? I find it horrible, to be honest. I find it a pretty strange way of doing things, but it is the way of doing things. So um, one of the things, I'm interested in. I, mean, I, I had the slides, didn't I? I said the theory was, it was, but relational database, one of the big selling points early on was it was based on theory. The trouble is the theory was the wrong theory. <laughs> it should have been category theory and it wasn't. So how do we get out of that? Um, well, one way of getting out of it is to abstract away from the relational level and program at a higher level which is much closer to programming in terms of relationships directly, which for us here is programming at the level of morphisms from what I had as non-V nodes to V, non-V nodes to non-V nodes. Um, so if you can program at a much higher level and have layers that translate from a well, logical level to the relational level, then over time, that weakens the whole of the relational model. Is my theory. <laughs> I would I would love to, love to see this new architecture um, instead of this <laughs> relational uh, database uh, thing, as you mentioned. Um, looking forward to that. Yeah. So uh, we have two more questions. Uh, we have a question from Todd and a question, and and Nathaniel has another question. So I'm, I'm going to ask uh, Todd's question first. Yeah. So Todd, Todd Wilson asked said that. Um, that the, the language prolog can be used to represent relational data and express, define yeah. Yeah. recursive connections between relations. Yeah. What extensions to prolog might be needed to capture the essence of your theory of data and how might these be pursued? So it's kind of related to what you were just talking about. Yeah, I think absolutely it is, yeah. And um, I once worked on a project where we were implementing a database and we needed to do a demonstration. We hadn't implemented the database. We was, it was written in C or something. And we, um, we prototyped it in Prolog so I, I, uh, because it's so easy to write simple databases in Prolog, yeah. Um, so yeah, I think, uh, I well, it depends on what you're trying to achieve, doesn't it? But if you're trying to achieve a demonstration of the ideas, then then this all could be written in Prolog, and you could have a layer at which you programmed at the level of morphisms uh, or relationships, um, and that it then um, 
took it down into a, you know, a relational uh, level. It's, it seems to me that it, that probably it's uh, down to things like speed and people need an implementation that can run really fast on large data sets, yeah, large I'm, I'm, databases. But I'm, then there is no I'm, reason why logical ones will not work. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, there's, there's no way I'm using Prolog for my live database in my company. Sorry. There's no use that I'm going to store data in Prolog. Using mm. it as an execution layer is, um, yeah. Uh, I'm sure it's it's fine. Yeah. Right. Right. Thank you. Thank you, John and uh, Todd, for your question. So, uh, Nathaniel, you can uh, you have a question. You can uh, unmute yourself. To ask your question again. Thanks. Just have one other question. Um, so, uh, about halfway through the talk, you mentioned sort of a more categorical approach to uh, Chen's transformation. Transformation, I think. Yeah. Um, I was wondering whether does this construction of um, a relational data specification from a logical data specification yeah. have some sort of universal property, like is it an adjoint or something, which be a nice way to sort of justify the informal yeah. practice. Um, yeah, if, if it's if it is, there's got to be a category of sketches, hasn't there? Um, so I'm not sure what that is. Um, Actually, that, that transformation, um, so I've written, I've used, written and used code that does that transformation and takes account of diagrams. So in the work that I've done, and this is, I'm a sort of one-man band. I'm working in a team, but I'm a one-man band when I'm coding commuting diagrams because no one else knows what a commuting diagram is. And I've written transformations that take account of them to generate um, correct schemas, you know, correct data in normal form. So it's something I've done. I, I've got an algorithm. Well, I've got code that does it, but it doesn't do it in the general case. And there's some care got to be taken in understanding the general case and understanding whether it you can take any sketch and do that or whether it's got to be a sort of highly structured stretch. Uh, the data specifications I've used, the, the diagrams are always, the commuting diagrams are all, always highly structured. Um, and that's something. What I like about this, so from a personal point of view, what I like about this gamma structure category view of things, which comes from having range categories, is that now I can study the math say of that transformation without it being some weird thing about software, but it being a purely mathematical problem. So I, I really, you know, that's a real step forward for me, actually. Yeah, that's very interesting. Thank you. So, yeah, Thank so you, what you say That's about presenting. it being an adjoint and looking is it, it, interesting, yeah. The potential. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and I think we have a last question from Brendan. Uh, his, Brendan Fong, his question is, uh, do you have an idea for further evolution of the theory and practice of data modeling after the hold of relational databases has been weakened? Yeah. So, um, you know, the diagram, uh, you can see the detail of it. The diagram I had, which was my version of Richard Barker's notation, uh, which is entity relationship modeling. I don't know if folks are familiar with entity relationship modeling of data. It, it's the technique that I kind of love. Um, and it's sort of at the level of categories, really. Um, so that's the notation I use. So, um, and I and I've done quite a. I've tried to write, and I've got a website actually, which is all about that notation. Um, so that's me trying to influence um, practice in a more practical way, not from a theoretical way. Um, Um, and I've got software, 
got it in GitHub. You could look at it. The trouble is, um, I'm only the only person that can use it at the moment. So there's a big project um, to um, support entity relationship modeling, and it's very graphical. There's diagramming software um, enhanced by commutative diagrams. Um, I, I wrote a paper actually on on commutative diagrams, which are called on the scope of relationships, which was years ago. Um, and I probably didn't call them commutative diagrams. So there's there's lots of sort of education to be done. Mm. And then there's tool support, software support to be developed. Um, and this presentation that you see here is coming at it from the point of view, if you could get a really elegant theory, then that's, surely that would carry some weight and get some focus on the issues and uh, and that would take it forward so it's sort of coming at it from a few different points i tend to come at it at different points of view at different directions at different times but it's very very kind of you to listen to the presentation and thank you <laughs> yeah thanks thanks a lot uh john and i i just want to i think uh just want to advertise uh, John's website uh, where, where we can find more material on this. It's uh, www.entitymodeling, that's one word, entitymodeling.org. And uh, I believe you can find more materials like the ones you just mentioned. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Nathaniel, yeah. also for the link. So, yeah, you won't find any mathematics there. You'll find me trying to explain the, the sort of user-orientated end of it, if you like. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, modeling is spelled with two L's because I spelled it the British way, but you'll find it. Oh, good. Thanks for pointing that out. <laughs> uh, I have I have a quick question. Uh, I'm not sure if it's quick, but uh, you know, these days people talk a lot about knowledge graphs, semantic web, storing everything as triples. It's um, yeah, not not the relational, not the usual relational database. Yeah, yeah. What but, What are your thoughts about that? I just wanted to know what I, your thoughts. I don't know where that. people. I don't, I don't know where people are coming from. I I kind of hate it because I love hmm. understand. I love modeling concepts, and what you see on an entity relationship model is a set of concepts drilled into that um diag the big diagram I put earlier. You see chromatogram, mass trace, um, into, you know, you'd see the concepts and they're the concepts that the scientists had and they're the concepts in the data. And then they go on the diagram and in the data specification. So if everything's in triples, what happens to all of that? I just don't know. Yeah, um, yeah. Gets, odd, yeah. Oddly enough, uh, someone that was almost my mentor, a guy called Harry Ellis, and he worked with Richard Barker and it, and he was an entity. He was absolutely crazy mad about entity modeling um, and using this notation. And it's, when I last looked at what he was doing, he'd flipped and he was doing triples. I couldn't believe it. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks. I, thanks. Nice to hear that. And, yeah. um, yeah, you know, I, I, I but I suspect, sorry, I, I suspect that what it's about is that the less structure you have, then the more resilient to change you are. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I don't know. Yeah, I, I think a lot Losing of Losing all your concepts in a pool of triples, I, I don't know why 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 you would do that. My, my understanding is that a lot of work there is goes into uh, building the, the right ontologies and understanding yeah. what the, the different relationships between entities, uh, objects yeah. are, uh, yeah. and how they relate to each other, how the relationships relate to each other. I'm um, all with that, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but but it's it's it is definitely. Uh, I mean, there there are some efficiency issues there that that people have been trying to resolve for years. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Uh, I think I'm going to end the uh, uh, YouTube live stream now. So uh, let's thank John again for for. Uh, wonderful talk and answering our questions. Thank you so much. And uh, I'm going to end the yeah, live stream thank you. now and we'll go to the private chat.